Hello, my name is Stuart Easton of Transparent Choice. Thanks for joining this week's webinar. Um, this one's a little bit more in your face than normal. Um, this comes from uh, various discussions that I've had with PMOs around the world where they say, yeah, yeah, you know, project prioritization, that, that's part of our planning process. But, I, but I'm sorry, it's not. Project prioritization should be job number one for any PMO. And my goal today is to set out the case for why that, that should be. For many people, that's going to sound kind of odd, but, um, uh, but hopefully by the end of this, you'll, you'll see why I say that. Um, you know, project prioritization is not about planning. It is about planning and budgeting, but it's about so much more than that. So let's dive in and, and see if we can understand why project prioritization should be job number one for, uh, for all PMOs. To get started, uh, let's just go through a quick summary. This is what I'm going to tell you about. Um, you know, why should it be job number one? Because project prioritization has a massive impact. It has an impact on your ability to hit strategic goals. It has a massive impact in terms of eliminating waste, uh, project success rates, the productivity of your people. I mean, it has an impact right across the whole piece. And if you don't do project prioritization right, you have a negative impact on all those things. Right? So, so this is really a foundation on which everything else, all those product methodologies, everything else flows from here. Um, another reason it should be job number one is because it's really quick to do. Uh, and we'll, we'll give you an example later on, but it, it's really quick to implement a, a good project prioritization process. Um, and it's very cheap. Right? It doesn't cost a lot compared to rolling out a PPM tool and training all your staff and, and uh, reworking all your processes. It's, it's very, very quick and very cost effective. But, and it's a big but, you have to do it right. There's a potential for it going wrong and then you don't actually achieve what you want to achieve. So um, to get started, let's think for a second about the portfolio itself. Now, this is one of my favorite characters. I'm not wild about the movie version, but Marvin the Paranoid Android is one of my favorite characters out of literature ever. Uh, it's from the Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy. And basically, he's an android, a robot, who's been given a very depressed personality. Right? So he walks around, he says things like, oh, what's the point? So what's, what's the point of your project portfolio? Well, in fact, it turns out the entire point of a project portfolio is to deliver strategic value. Now, some people push back on me when I say things like that. And they say, well, we've got to ensure compliance or, or, uh, or, or something. Well, do you know what? Being compliant with regulations, that is a strategic driver. Right? So the, there is only one point of your project portfolio, which is to deliver strategic value to your organization. That's it, the end. Now, how you do that is by enacting change, right? Because the environment's changing, your goals are changing, your competitors are changing. So, so the portfolio is, is kind of a way that you enact change within the organization through projects and programs. So that means we need to do two things really well if we're going to deliver this, this vision, to deliver the promise of the portfolio. First of all, you've got to deliver things that actually move you towards your strategic goals, right? So you need your portfolio to be aligned. And then the second thing is you have to deliver those projects well. So here are some interesting numbers from the PMI. Projects that are aligned with strategy are 57% more likely to achieve their business goals than those that aren't. They're more likely to finish on time, 50% uh, more likely to finish on time, 45% more likely to finish on budget. Right? These, these are really big numbers. Right? So it turns out that aligning your projects to strategy not only helps you achieve those goals because you're aligned with your goals, but it also helps you with that second dimension that I talked about, the, the execution piece. Right? So it helps you implement them more successfully. So how does that work, right? That's, that's, not, that's not intuitive. So let's think about where you have a load of projects in your portfolio that are not well aligned. And usually you end up with too many projects in the, in the portfolio as well. Right? This is the most deadly disease out there for, for portfolios is, is having too many projects. 
So when you have too many projects, um, your people have to kind of multitask. They have to figure out, uh, you know, what am I doing today? They're pushed around uh, and task jumping is inefficient. Multitasking is inefficient. Uh, and, and is not generally not a good idea. I spent a few minutes online uh, and found a couple of examples of multitasking that probably isn't a good idea. Uh, this one, this one amused me. I, I'm the father of twins. So there were times when the, the boys were babies that uh, I may have been guilty of <laughs> doing things like this. Um, but anyway, multitasking generally not a good idea. And it's a killer for productivity uh, within, uh, within project teams. Um, if you have too many projects, if you have projects that aren't aligned, people don't know what to work on, they tend to rush things and they make errors. And as, as soon as you make errors, um, uh, so I said, you know, they don't know what to do first, as soon as they make errors, you get this chain reaction because then you've got to spend time fixing the errors, which means you have less time to deliver the rest of the projects. And so projects start getting delayed, they start going wrong, they start missing the scope. Uh, not you know, cutting corners and then you don't achieve the business goal, at which point there's no point doing it, right? If you're not achieving the business goal, there's no point doing the project, right? So, so let's stop doing this. Let's get out of this mode. Um, you know, nobody wants to be this guy. We know that's not going to end well, <laughs> okay? So, so the solution is really clear prioritization of projects. Um, when you pick projects that are really supporting your, uh, or rather when you look at your projects and, and clearly identify which ones um, are delivering strategic value or will deliver strategic value. It, and, and, and if you look at your existing portfolio, look at the projects that are going well and going badly. Right? You end up with a picture like this. And most organizations are going to have projects dotted all over the place here. And I would argue that anything that isn't delivering strategic value, really good strategic value, is waste, right? It's just waste. If it's not, the whole point of the portfolio is to deliver strategic value, is to move the organization forward. And so projects that aren't doing that, they, they may provide a positive ROI, but, you know, delivering profit is, is only one little piece of the overall goals of your organization. Right? So, so don't confuse return on investment with actually adding value to the business. Right? So usually you find uh, when we talk to our customers that they have projects in all four of these quadrants. So let's kill these ones. And then let's look at these ones, right? So these are the ones that are good strategic fit and these are the ones that are doing well, the projects are going well, these are the projects that are going badly. If we kill these guys and just focus on the ones in the top, especially these guys up here, we can turn those from being uh, good strategic fit but potentially going to fail to good strategic fit and succeeding. So we've eliminated waste, right? We've refocused on important projects and we've made those projects more successful, right? That's, that's a big win. We're delivering an awful lot more value just by doing that. So, so that's, you know, and, and to a large degree, that's why prioritization has this huge impact because it allows you to focus and it allows you to focus on the things that are going to add value and to deprioritize stuff that doesn't really add value. Uh, but that's not all. There's a bit more to it than that. When projects are really strongly aligned to, uh, to the strategy and the goals of the organization, then you start to get a bit of peer pressure amongst the execs. Right? If you're an executive sponsor of an important project, all the other execs want to know what's happening to that project. So suddenly, your ex and your executive sponsor themselves want the project to be successful. So suddenly you get your executive sponsors waking up and really taking ownership of, of the project and, and getting involved. That can only be a good thing. Um, also, if you do prioritization properly, what you're doing is you're really quantifying what the value to the organization of each project is. And when you do that, you can communicate that. You can put that focus on business value right at the heart of the implementation of the project, right? So, so then when you, you have developers or whatever uh, writing code, they can be making small decisions that could go either way, um, the, but making them so that they're aligned with what you're trying to achieve. So, for example, if, if you're laying out a uh, customer, customer self-help page 
and one of your corporate goals is to have really happy customers, then you probably put a little bit more effort into making that page usable than, than if you just, if you just say, well, we just need a page, right? So the business goal of that page matters and the people within the project delivering the project can make different decisions. If you clearly have a statement at the beginning from the prioritization process of what the project is for and you communicate that to the team. And also what kind of a byproduct of all of this is that by bringing much more focus to the whole process, you can kind of reduce the change stress on an organization. Every project that gets started, every project that gets going puts change stress, right? The stress of changing stuff on to uh, different parts of the organization. And again, by prioritizing and focusing, you might reduce the total number of projects that you start, but you, my, my guess is you'll also increase the number of projects that get finished and get finished on time, on spec, and on budget. Right. So, so these are all other benefits. And I, I, I could keep going, right? We could do a whole hour on, on just this bit, but we won't. So if prioritization is so important, y you prioritize projects today. You have a way, you have a planning cycle, you figure out which projects to do. You herd the executives into a room and you, you throw ideas out, out there. You may even have a spreadsheet. And you pick projects, right? So what's different? Why, you know, what, what's going on? Well, first of all, this is really important. Not all prioritization methods are the same. Okay, look at it this way. Um, th that's footwear. You can put your feet in it. It's got wheels, but those are not roller skates, right? Those, you know, you take those down to the local, the local sports, sports hall and start roller skating around with all the other folks. Yeah, the wheels will fall off. You, you'll be going slower than everybody else. It just, it just doesn't do the job. Um, similarly, you know, it's on his vehicle and he's sitting on it. So I guess it's a seat, but that's not a seat that I would want to sit on, right? It doesn't look very comfortable and so on. So in the same way, not all project prioritization processes are the same. And it, it turns out that this is something that academics are, are really interested in around the world. Um, so over the last couple of decades, um, there have been uh, lots and lots of different methods proposed and, and evaluated and researched uh, by academics um, around the world. And last year, 2017, um, the University of New South Wales published a, a review of all that work. And they looked at over 100 methodologies for doing projects. So this is everything from simple spreadsheet to... Uh, weighted scoring, to just presenting it, to you know, just all kinds of different methodologies. And what they found was actually quite shocking. What they found was that out of those hundred methodologies, including the one that you're using today and most, most likely, right, out of all those methodologies, only two were suitable for doing project prioritization. Only two. One called DEA, and one called AHP. Now, transparent choice, we use AHP. And we chose AHP because it was simpler, and, uh, and actually their research kind of said the same thing, that it's easier to use, and you know, so that's, that's great. Looks like we made a good choice when we picked AHP five years ago. Um, so this, this, is, this is a really big deal, right? It has big implications, right? If, if best practice equals AHP, then those spreadsheets that you got should be fired. If you're using a PPM tool, right? They don't use AHP as a general rule. I, I'm only aware of one PPM tool that uses AHP, and and as, and as far as I can tell, they missed the most important part of AHP, which is the, the collaboration piece. So basically, if you're using spreadsheets or you're using um, uh, uh, a PPM tool then uh, you, you know, you're just not doing it right. And Transparent Choice is a leader in this space. There are a couple other companies that do this, that use AHP. Um, so one is called Decision Lens, one is called Expert Choice. Go check them out. Um, it seems kind of odd me sending you to some of my competitors, but, but you know, uh, the goal of this webinar is to help you be successful. Right. So whether it's with us or one of our competitors, I don't care. I want you to be successful. Right. So there are only, to my, to my knowledge, there are only three companies that do this well. 
uh, it's, it's ourselves, transparent choice, decision lens, and expert choice. So, so why is it so different? Well, it, it comes down to this, right? When, when you're picking a portfolio of projects, what you're trying to do is maximize the value, the business value, the strategic value that you're giving to the business. Uh, the problem is, how do you how do you define value? What's the definition of value? Right. So, you, so maybe you go to one of your stakeholders, uh, your CEO, whoever it is, right? And he's pretty calm. He's pretty collected. And if you're really lucky, he'll give you a set of business goals that you can use as criteria. So it might be things like improving customer service or uh, improving financial performance or whatever whatever it may be. Whatever these goals are that you can turn into criteria and use. In your uh, in your evaluation of, of project requests. Now, I say if you're really lucky because humans are really terrible at this kind of thing, and the chances of even one person giving you a true, complete, fair picture of what those goals and drivers are is is not very high, because we're all pushed and shoved by what's going on this week, what happened last week, what did we read in the newspaper today, and that influences our uh, our response to questions like, what are the strategic goals? Okay. Now, hopefully, if you've got a good CEO or something, they'll have, they'll have spent a lot of time on that and they'll be able to talk a bit about that. But the problem is, um, the rest of the team isn't aligned with that, right? If you ask five different executives what the strategic goals and, and the, and the importance of those strategic goals, you'll get 10, 15 different answers from those five executives, depending on which day of the week you ask them. So you really have to get agreement about uh, what the goals and drivers are from, uh, from, that, from your stakeholder group in order to, um, to make that happen. And, and this is where AHP comes in. So AHP is a branch of decision science and it's been around for about 40 years and it's been researched to death and refined and improved. And basically what it does is it helps groups of people improve the quality of their decision making. So it helps eliminate all kinds of biases and so forth. Um, and it helps them do that in a way that builds buy-in and consensus. And, and it's only when you have that buy-in that people will trust the scoring of your projects. Right? So you can put together the best um, uh, spreadsheet to score projects you like, but if people don't trust the data that comes from that, then guess what? They're not going to—they're not going to buy into the portfolio. They're going to try and sneak projects in the side. They're going to try and jam a few more in at the end, right? And you're going to be back to to where you started. And going through this very structured AHP process, rather paradoxically, we we usually find that it speeds up the overall project selection process, but, but by putting in place this structured collaboration based on real decision science and psychology research, um, you get this, this level of buy-in and commitment to action that makes the difference between a successful portfolio and one that, that tends to fall apart. So, okay, you say, Stuart, that all sounds wonderful, but you know, how does it really work? So here's an example. Uh, this is one of our customers. Uh, it's a government department. The portfolio is about 80 million US dollars, um, depending on exchange rate. Now, this customer actually had really good, robust data. Right? They were estimating projects reasonably well. Uh, they understood what their resource pools were pretty well. You know, they, they were quite mature. They had a really good uh, spreadsheets. <coughs> Excuse me. They had really good spreadsheets that used weighted scoring, so they had some criteria, and they were they were weighted, and they converted all of that into some really nice uh, data analytics, you know, nice reports and things. But they failed, right? And in their case, failure looked like this: um, they had about twenty percent of the project. Uh, resources committed to projects that were just pet projects, right? They, they weren't really adding value overall, but there was one person who had a lot of influence who thought they were important and pushed them. And then they had about 30% too many projects in in the hopper, right? They had too many, they, and they knew it wasn't it wasn't accidental. It didn't happen because they didn't know. 
they knew in the meeting that they were overcommitting, but they still did it. Right? And the result was project failure, as we talked about. You know, too many projects, uh, the wrong projects, not delivering the value that, that they really wanted to get. Um, so why, you know, if you think about it, why, how can you end up like this? Right? If they had weighted scores, how can you end up with pet projects? Well, the answer is that that, that executive sponsor, that, that senior executive, excuse me, didn't believe the scoring. Why do you get 30% too many projects in there? Because um, when the bucket gets full, everyone just tries to throw one or two more in, and they don't really believe the scoring well enough to kind of say, yes, the bucket's full, we stop now. So they all try and put one more, you know, every, every project sponsor tries to squeeze one more in, and they're not going to say to the person across the table, no, 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 you can't put your project in there, it's full. Why? Well, because then that, spon that project sponsor will come and tell you the same thing. You can't put your project in because it's full. So over a three-week period, we, we and I'll say that again, three weeks from the very first discussion with them to the big workshop where they selected their portfolio, three weeks. Right, so that and that included doing the demonstration, uh, doing a proof, quick proof of concept, uh, getting contracts in place. Right, three weeks. So, initial contract, we got some data in. Uh, we were lucky they had a load of data. We looked at the core drivers. We did the whole AHP thing, uh, which which we've got demos and things on our website. So go look at that if you want to see it working. So we did the whole AHP thing. Uh, with the executive team, and the net result was um, uh, that the sponsor of the pet projects killed his own pet projects. Now, I have a slightly dark sense of humor, so the picture that I wanted to put in here about killing pet projects uh, was censored by our marketing department <laughs> that's been removed. Um, so, big win. We've just freed up 20% of our resources. Woo! Yeah! And we've done it without any political wrangling. He killed his own projects because he trusted the model. They were able to right-size the portfolio. So when the bucket was full, they drew a line. They said, that's it. The bucket's full. And by the way, if we manage to get through those projects, the next two or three are these ones. Okay, so they have this balance between capacity and demand that was just you know, impossible to achieve before. Um, the projects were supported, not just at the executive level, but right down the organization. Because they rolled out, uh, they, they took the, the criteria weighting and they rolled that out and they rolled out the logic for selecting projects. And because they did that, they, they got support right across the piece, right? From, the, from, uh, from people implementing the projects right up to senior executives and up to the board. Because they were able to clearly set out why we're doing these projects, how they support uh, our, our strategy, and, and so on. And finally, they were able to align all the projects to the corporate goals, which means everybody's going the same direction, a little bit like these penguins, right? Everybody's going the same direction and you get more done when that happens. It's really simple. So that kind of brings us right back around. So this is a real example of how it, how it works. So that kind of brings us right back around to the beginning. Right. Why is it job? Why should project prioritization be job number one? Because it has massive impact. It's fast. It, it's it's uh, low cost. Um, but you have to do it right. Just doing any old thing doesn't do it right. Uh, it's not going to get you to where you need to be. And and this is really all that that transparent choice does. We do that top piece where you're doing demand generation, so uh, demand management rather, capturing the 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 project requests. Uh, the strategic alignment piece of defining goals and priorities and then selecting and optimizing that portfolio to allow you to deliver the maximum value from the resources available to you. And that's it. So hopefully now you can see why I'm so passionate about this. You can see why I think that project prioritization should be job number one for every PMO on the planet. Thank you very much for your time.